Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's episode of MHTV. Um, tonight, we've got a really interesting session as we're talking about um, the use of green and blue space on mental health. And we've got two really interesting guests who I'll come on to in a minute for them to introduce themselves. Um, but first, I'm just going to hand you over to my colleague, Nikki, because Nikki is going to be doing the social media tonight. So she'll tell you a little bit about how you can join in. Absolutely. So lovely to see everybody, particularly on fireworks night. Um, today, we're going to be live on Facebook, so you can follow us there. Um, any comments you have, any questions, please put them in, um, and we'll do our best to make sure our guests have an opportunity to answer them. And if you're following us on Twitter, it's the hashtag MHTV. So please join in. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Nikki. Okay, so I'm going to go over to Sarah and Liz to introduce themselves. And also, if you can just say a little bit about what you mean by green prescribing um, and green and blue space for people who might not be familiar with those terms as well, that'd be great. So I've got Sarah on my screen first. So if, if it's okay with you, we'll start with you, Sarah. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Sarah House. I am a lecturer in mental health nursing at Plymouth University. And I've been working um, really with nature for mental health probably for a couple of decades now. So some of that has been work with nursing students during the course of their training. Um, and some of that has been with our patients or clients in practice as well. And with staff as well, really looking at staff wellbeing. So lots of different ways that you can engage with nature and use nature. Um, I've been involved in some research projects for the National Park, looking at green prescribing and also for um, a project called Nurse Us, which looks at sustainability, education, and uh, health, and the natural environment, I guess. So lots of different sort of strands to my interest. Um, Liz, do you want to introduce yourself before I go on to talk about blue and green space and all that? Yeah, real. Okay. Hi, I'm Liz, and I've, I've actually, uh, retrained later in life as a mental health nurse and I went to Plymouth University so that's why I met Sarah she was one of my lecturers um, and I suppose we really connected because from my first year um, well I'm, I'm really keen on sea swimming and at Plymouth mm -hmm. at our lunch times I met up with a friend who was up for going for a swim so we'd, we'd leg it down at lunch time to Plymouth Hoe <laughs> throw ourselves <laughs> in the sea and then try yeah. and get back in time for afternoon lectures so um yeah, and so we, Sounds when, identical. <laughs> yeah, when we stood, got into sort of Sarah's group, she was really keen on the idea and um, gave us extended lunch breaks and encouraged as much Brilliant. as support to join in. And, you know, if they weren't, didn't like the idea of throwing themselves into a grey sea in November, they were, they could, you know, go, go and walk in the park or anyway. So basically I uh, qualified a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I've been swimming myself for the last 16 years, love nature generally, um, and in practice on, you know, I haven't got vast experience, but on my inpatient ward experience, um, I found it really an effective way to de-escalate um, people mm -hmm. just by stepping outside and changing your environment, um, to encouraging people to join groups, and in my work as a, a community mental health nurse. Um, Again, a lot of our sessions were would just be going out for a walk and talking rather than being in a stuffy room, um, which seemed to be really helpful. You connect in a different way. Um, and I'm involved in a swimming um, project at the moment. Um, and just basically green and blue spaces are, fun are fancy terms for being outside in, in nature. You know, and it's something that we've known for centuries is beneficial, but I think in the modern day we've become quite cut off from that yeah. so it's it's kind of recognizing its worth and value and also trying to look after it so that it's, it's not just that we're taking from it but trying to um, engage with it and look after it as well that was a real ramble <laughs> no no i mean it's really interesting isn't it it's, uh, and i think you know, given the geography of where you're both based as well you know, it, it sounds like, you know, making the most of, of the opportunities. But I like the fact that you're focusing on, you know, green and um, blue space for your own sort of mental health and well-being yeah. as well, which, um, you know, is something that I'm passionate about as well. But you mentioned then about, um, you know, we've known um, about nature being beneficial for a long time. Do you think that recently 
become more connected with nature again because that's something I've been wondering around with all the restrictions and everything through social distancing and everything being closed do you think that's helped people connect more with nature I think it has you know people suddenly finding themselves with more time on their hands you know actually being forgiven to rush around or to to jet off to beautiful far-flung places for those that have had that privilege but I think you know that that restriction and actually knowing you only had an hour but you know it encouraged a lot of people to get back out there um, and find beautiful spots within you know a much closer range to their own houses you know and I, I think you know, we've spoken about this before Sarah and I that you're um we are very lucky mm. with where we personally live and yeah. much appreciate that people yeah. in, in the cities didn't have that that same privilege on their doorstep it's yeah like yeah that. You know, I think some people yeah. can live in a beautiful place and not engage with it or appreciate it. And people can live at the top of a tower block and find joy in the sky or, you know, so it's it's unequal. Yeah. But on the other hand, I don't think you necessarily have to be privileged to benefit. Yeah. 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 I think so, that um, the, the whole lockdown experience, you know, it doesn't take much sort of looking at, TV programs and the press, um, organisations like um, the RSPB, uh, Royal Horticultural Society, are all talking about mental health and mm. nature. Talking about mental health and nature on Autumn Watch last week with a special feature on there. So I, I think that something that that people didn't talk about much now is, has come very much in the public eye and awareness yeah. of the impact of um, lockdown on our mental health and as we start again today I think it's really interesting because when lockdown first hit we were coming into spring the sun was out the flowers were beginning to burst and that sort of seemed to provide some kind of an antidote to the gloom of the situation for people people having to do it in a different way and I wonder if coming back into this now if the fact that we're entering winter and we're entering that dark time, if it if it's kind of like a, a mirror of our internal landscape to some extent, you know, the trees are bare, it's cold, it feels very different maybe this time. And um, I think our relationship with nature changes through the seasons and maybe it can reflect something of where we are. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? And that, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you mentioned about green prescribing. Do you want to say a little bit about um, what that is? And Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think the idea was um, that um, really a lot of people who are struggling with their mental health, you know, having a purely medicalised response to that to that difficulty isn't necessarily always helpful. Of course, it's not saying you would choose nature over mental health, I think. We must be clear about that um, over medication, sorry. But I think with green prescribing, the idea was that GPs or um, some mental health professionals could actually encourage people instead um, of uh, doing some of the more traditional activities to get outside into nature. So an example of that was that I um, helped to do some research for Dartmoor and Exmoor National Park that looked at getting people out into the natural environment here to improve yeah. their mental health. And there are similar projects that have happened all over the country, um, sometimes in city environments. Mm -hmm. I know that there's been a, um, a similar project at Dartmoor Zoo. Um, some, you know, there's several uh, examples of how this works. And so the idea is that, that people would go to a place, um, usually in nature and usually supported by some kind of, of organization. Often it will be um, yeah. third sector providers, charities. So people like um, Mind or yeah. um, often the wildlife charities are really involved in this. Mm, that's good. And I think that there's something really beneficial about that because people aren't out in a kind of clinical space they're out yeah. in a natural yeah. space it's yeah. often a social space where they can go together and uh, they can spend time in nature so there's lots about it that's really good you know the, the outcomes from a lot of the studies are really encouraging we talk about people uh, feeling a sense of connection yeah. enjoyment relaxation but um, I think there are also potentially some problems 
um, with green prescribing in, in that we're starting to use that language of medicalization and people don't necessarily need a prescription to get outside. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, with, with the green prescribing side of things, you often need somebody who can broker that initial relationship. People are very low, finding it hard to get outside. And so it's not free. Yeah, there are resource implications. Um, yeah, so it's it's interesting, I think. Um, yeah what, what have you found have been some of the um, barriers because it's something that I think about a lot um around the inequalities um you know in this conversation as you say you know um green space isn't open to everyone is it no. you know for all kinds of reasons so what what are the barriers um I think, point of view? sorry I didn't mean to talk over you I no, think that no. there are, are several um actually as much as I love it and as much as I think it can be a really positive thing um, I think that often you get images of very healthy, fit looking people climbing up the side of, of a mountain or something. And True. if you've not been feeling very healthy, if you've not been feeling very well, um, the idea that you're going to be taken out into, uh, you know, a space like that mm. can be really intimidating. Um, People worry about having the right gear. You know, if you're going out into outdoor spaces, what happens if you haven't got a warm coat and you haven't got, you know, a pair of boots? So sometimes poverty is a real inequality. Paying to get there, transport, parking fees, you know, all of people yeah. worrying about what am I going to eat when I get there? If you haven't got very much money and you've got crap sandwiches and, you know, that sort of thing yeah. can, can really make people feel different and other and like they can't go and they can't participate mm -hmm. and something that came up in the research that I did and that I've seen in, in lots of other cases is um, that it's a very white environment often so mm -hmm. there are real kind of problems in terms of access and inequality and also you know what happens if you're in a wheelchair sometimes getting out into those spaces is really difficult so some of the people who most need to, to be out um, don't always get the opportunity to go out yeah yeah and of course thinking about mothers for example and the mm. of um, you know young mothers um, particularly um, you know who might live in you know urban areas or high-rise buildings you know um, you know we know a lot about um, you know postnatal depression it's constantly in the press but you know for those of us who've had babies we know that it, it can be quite a struggle if you don't have a car kind of going out getting on public transport um and that kind of thing so there's all kinds of um barriers isn't there and inequalities and i know i think i was saying before we went live that i had a conversation a while ago with um, a town planner who was saying the councils are starting to think much more about the routes that people take so i think that's really important and actually thinking you know the walk from kind of home to school you know is it a concrete walk or is there any access to nature um just things that can make a difference can people's health just having that access absolutely and we know that you know there's there's a lot of work out there that's been done that that identifies that even viewing um, a natural space from a window um, can really positively impact on mental health and it can impact on recovery from illness in hospital and the amount of pain pain medication that people take so and the amount of um, time that they ask from us as, as nurses as well so yeah. there's lots of really interesting work out there and um, you know I, th I think that the town planning is a really important issue Mm -hmm. as is looking at the way um, that we provide care and the environments that we provide care in you know it would it really take that much to to maybe look at the hospital setting itself and to have those small gardens and those small areas where we can plant things maybe with our patients absolutely I mean a few years ago um, I used to manage a mother and baby unit and we got some money from the King's Fund for um, enhancing healing environment program and that was absolutely fantastic you know that was um, a group of mothers coming together um, and talking about what they would want in terms of the space becoming more therapeutic and the focus was absolutely on nature that sense of like bringing the outside in yeah um, and that's what we created but I also felt 
um, and I don't know what you think about this in terms of the work you've done, that there was some there was a definite strong link between um, nature and creativity as well, and people's sense of sort of spiritual well being as well. Oh. And I think the three components just really came together in that work. And I'll never forget it because it was so significant, the impact it had on, you know, on the women on that unit. Vanessa, it really reminds me of a, um, a, a experience that I had. And I was working in a city in the UK um, and I did a lot of, I used a lot of artwork, um, art groups, creative writing groups with people. And I remember being in a creative writing group with a group of young African men. And um, the theme that had been chosen for the day was nature. And at first, they really kind of struggled to understand what I meant by that. They didn't really have experience of the countryside in the UK. And they, mm -hmm. they spotted some seed pods that were on the table in front of me. And uh, one of them picked up the seed pod and said, oh, my God, I, I know these. I remember these. We had these in the village where I grew up. And what followed was the most amazing story of dislocation from their land, um, from their culture, from their community and arriving in a city, living in a tower block, not really knowing anybody. And um, then they understood what we meant and it was one of the most sort of profound hours I think I ever had as a nurse yeah. seeing and hearing those stories yeah so for me nature can kind of um mirror back something to us and and it yeah. you know there's there's kind of symbols that tell us something about ourselves and our culture and our community yeah and yeah, kind I of, really agree yeah and just that sort of spiritual connection with um, you know the earth and the universe and realizing that you know we're only kind of small beings in a much bigger much bigger world and that sense of mindfulness as well I think you know from being amongst nature and actually really focusing on your surroundings and you know um the beauty of nature and spirituality is so important, isn't it, in the healing journey, how we find meaning, how um, we 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 make sense of the world that we live in. And those sort of diminutive experiences of being out under the stars and realising how small we are um, can really help us to just maybe change our perspective on things and experience things in a different way. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think as a child, the first poem I ever came across which my dad introduced me to was Oscar Wilde's poem Ballad of Reading Jail and even though now I'm in my 40s I remember the line about him being able to see the sky and um, and years later I went to work in prisons and totally had an appreciation of that because there's such concrete uh, you know miserable depressing environments and you know just being able to give people access to being able to see the sky or nature you know it's it's transformative isn't it for people and I think it's um you know like you say it can be really profound as well the experience yeah. and then um, it was making me think of what Liz was saying about um kind of you know sometimes it doesn't have to be anything major does it but actually taking somebody for a walk can just totally change the tone of an interaction as well with somebody in the dynamic of the relationship I don't know is whether you want to say anything about your experiences in that area. Yeah, I, I totally agree a, with you. It's, mm. like, it's kind of a real leveller. I think if you're outdoors and walking with somebody, it can, you know, sometimes it's been the case that I've just started a conversation or, or pointed something out, and that's generally, you know, because I could witter on for ages for, for my love of nature, but quite often, you know, yeah. there's, there's space in the conversation and I think when people can make their own discoveries and about how they're feeling outside and work, working with what they bring. Yeah. And, um, no, I agree. I just I think just that, that change of physical environment and, and taking, as I've managed to take some um, people from the ward to join yeah. a wellbeing in nature group in a, a, where the forest school was set up and the, just that change of environment to go to, for an overheated brightly lit ward mm. woodlands I think it was in November it was a rainy day but they have the it's beautifully set up and they have a they had a campfire going under a canvas and cooked a soup to eat at lunchtime and everybody just sat sat around the fire they could whittle things or could just sit and enjoy and share the food and that you know we would none of us wanted to go back to the ward <laughs> it yeah. was just, 
absolutely amazing and the conversations that you know we didn't have to do or say anything fancy it was it was just being in that environment and people would yeah. start talking about childhood memories they were different, yeah. different people I felt like a different person mm. it's a Never level, you know it's it's just yeah. shared human experience it's nothing you know there's nothing yeah that we bring that's any different to what they bring in their I don't know it just gives people a chance to be human and then yeah so I was just going to say I've never really heard about people using um, forest schools in the context of mental health because you know I've had a lot of conversations about you know forest schools for young people and particularly you know as alternatives to nursery and things which is fantastic but um yeah I mean I can totally see what you're saying and maybe that's something that you know needs to be looked at you know across the country really because you know we've got forest schools in in Yorkshire certainly um I've not heard of anybody doing that I might be wrong though but I've not come across anyone doing that kind of work I've done something with oh sorry Liz no no that's difficult I've been carried away go on yeah, no, I mean it, it's just difficult because I you know I was a really qualified nurse yeah. and I went straight on to the acute inpatient ward and I was kind of only I was only able to do that work because it I um part of the preceptorship program was to do a um service improvement proposal so mine was about trying to get people outdoors basically yeah. so I was, I was able to take people off the ward um, um mm. to the forest school and that was really profound sadly though I mean in the back in the real world it was very very hard to resource that you know, you know yeah. you're, you're in the number well sorry I was qualified then but um but even you know the conversation just taking two people off the ward on that one occasion you know they came back and were full of it and there was a real curiosity amongst staff and yeah the other people on the ward um about what this had been like and the conversations that just sparked yeah that. and i think you know I, d I don't know what the follow-up was but i know one of the women when she was discharged was going to join a local walk and talk group mm. there was a young man in his he was 19 who was very keen to sort of carry on attending the forest school group um yeah that's good there is um you two might know there is some sort of project where you can you can register and volunteer so that if people are wanting to go out in nature um they can be buddied up with people and i was hearing about it a while ago and i thought it sounded like a great idea because as you say sometimes people might not feel confident to go out on their own yeah. um, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and pick it up yeah what saying about inequality earlier as well i heard a brilliant thing on i think it was on radio but about a group of it was one one woman she set up the black girls hike because she's on a train going through the peak district and you know really wanted to be out there but was really reflecting it you know you don't see there's no not role models that's the wrong you know when you don't see yourself represented in those mm. environments it's hard yeah. to, harder to access so that yeah it's, that's an, there's some really good initiatives coming up yeah. yeah, there's there's quite a bit out there. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, there's uh, the what we found with the green prescribing and, and several of the other projects that I've been in is if people haven't grown up with a contact with nature or um, they weren't very experienced or they didn't see people out there that represented them, um, and some women as well that felt really nervous about being on their own out in nature um kind of needed somebody or a group to to help to make that initial access easier and then yeah. the idea of green prescribing and projects like that is that eventually because people have become acclimatized they can then let go of the group and they can continue to have that yeah, in their that. life as a well-being yeah. strategy yeah definitely no, that's great. Um, you mentioned um, about a, to um, a toolkit. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that as well? Was that me or Liz? Yeah. I yeah. Um, I think, yeah, when uh, the research for the national parks, we obviously we looked at the experience of people going out into nature. Um, uh, so I, I spoke to GPs, I spoke to the group members, I spoke to volunteers. Um, and you know people that were kind of helping to facilitate um the sessions so we had sort of lots of different perspectives on on the scheme 
and we we took evaluations and feedback obviously and and sort of looked at that whole experience but the whole idea was that um alongside that we produced a toolkit so if anybody was interested in green prescribing um schemes that the we, we put together a kind of framework of things that they might want to think about um, to help get them off the ground and things that, that typically tend to come up as a problem. Mm. So, for example, things like transport, stuff that is perhaps difficult to solve, particularly it seems for us in rural communities where we don't have the buses and people can be very isolated and there's all kinds of interesting stuff about rural mental health. So. So, yeah, um, we put together a toolkit um, and that's something that I can certainly provide a link for if anybody's interested and would like yeah, to have a look yeah, at that. Definitely. I'm sure people would. I'd like to see it as well. I'm sure they'll be interested in that. Um, Nikki, just, um, have you got some questions there, Nikki? I have, yeah. Okay. People, are, people are really enjoying this, so thank you very much. Sure. Um, I've got three questions. So the first one is from Sam saying, are there any voluntary sector services in Devon for supporting people to get to green spaces and any peer support? Um, and I've got another one, which is a, an observation from, uh, from one of our colleagues on Twitter saying, it's a luxury and a privilege to enjoy access to green and blue spaces, um, but sometimes uh, those spaces aren't psychologically safe as they can, as people can be reviewed or they're, they're not from around here, they don't belong mm. here. And there's been mm. some real issues with racism and yeah. people trying to access um, rural spaces, and um, particularly in America, where it's resulted in people being murdered. So yeah. I think it would be interesting to see what you guys uh, oh, want to comment on with that. And I have one from a, oh, sorry, go on. One, more, one last one from a student saying, um, what can I do? Oh, yeah, lovely. Yeah, I, don't I, know I live which, in London, what can I do? <laughs> one of those uh, sort of such a gorgeous, rich um, <laughs> Uh, run of questions. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to tackle um, the racism question, first of all, because this is something that's come up also in some research that I'm doing at the moment, looking at student experiences of time in nature. And I know that in the UK, the UK, as Liz has already talked about, one group that's come up, there's organisations like Black to Nature who intend to take young people that are set up by Maya Rose who I think has done some stuff on, on Autumn Watch and, and what have you um, that is specifically for young people because people are underrepresented they don't see themselves they don't feel safe and I know that that organization takes out groups of young people young black people and people of color into nature um, and helps them to uh, you know access that and feel comfortable and feel welcome in those settings. There are black birder groups coming up now and there's there's been quite a few articles lately but something that I found is that there were some myths around nature as well when I started to look at this. There's some stuff written that kind of seems to suggest that black people and people of colour don't like being in nature um, which really is a nonsense <laughs> you know we're, we're all natural people that the um you know we're, we're a part of it aren't we in various ways and so um it's very real and yeah. uh people do feel very intimidated and i'm very conscious that here we are we're a group of white people talking about what it's like yeah. um to be trying to access nature if you're a person of color and um that's it. I think it's it's a massive problem and it's one that we all need to be really aware of and we need to, to have a much greater cultural awareness. And I think of things like white privilege and what yeah. we take for granted and what we can access without mm -hmm. without struggle. So mm -hmm. and without fear. Without yeah. fear, big time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. People going out and frightened that they're gonna be hurt or um just looked at. Um mm -hmm in a way that makes them feel other, othered and like they don't belong. So we've got work to do, all of us. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I think a lot of that as well is it's not us kind of setting things up, it's really connecting with communities, isn't it? And, and finding out what they're doing. I thought that's what was so lovely about the, the um, sorry, I'll keep looking because I've but the group that I spoke about earlier, because that was an initiative, a woman on a train looking out the window and thinking, I want to be out there doing that and, and encouraging friends to go out with her. And it's not, you know, us saying, why don't you do this? It's kind of making yeah. making yeah. space and being supportive, isn't it? It's not what we think people might enjoy. It's, it's, um, 
It's such a good point because, you know, you, I think that a lot of this has to come from within those communities themselves to, to feel that support there. Because if you set up a group for, for black people, people of colour, um, as a white person, you know, it's, there's, there's something quite problematic about that for me. Of course, I'd want to support that wholeheartedly, but in some sense, that's not my work. Um, yeah. So I want to support people who maybe need some guidance about how to set up groups in nature yeah. or how to do green prescribing to make sure that people who are least represented and least um, able to make use of this feel like they've got a place and they're welcome. So, yeah. And that does cut across, that goes across some um, marginalised people, doesn't it? I mean, that's, I mean, that's why this is so <coughs> exciting, isn't it, with the conversation about mental health problems because that often mm. is the underrepresented mm. groups in society isn't it regardless mm. yeah so do you have anything for on um devon yes. and green spaces and peer support De devon green spaces and peer support um yes i mean i think the transport problem is is unfortunately a problem that we have down here and that was sort of outside the scope of what we could do in that study and it's something that we recommended needed to be looked at um, and something that I know has been sort of brought up at a, count, at a county level as well. But certainly in terms of peer support, we've got a network. Um, we call it the Sustainability Health and Wellbeing Interest Group, or SHWIG. Um, and people can contact me if they would like to be a part of that. That's open um, to people in practice, it's open to our students, it's open to anybody in the Southwest Peninsula, um, so beyond Devon. And I would sort of say even beyond that, if you are elsewhere in the country and you don't have a network and you would like to be a part of something, then, um, you know, get in contact with us. There's so much happening at a national level as well. We've got the Sustainable Development Unit, um, you know, there's, there's various... Um, groups that are now beginning to spring up so if anybody is feeling isolated and would like a, a kind of friendly <laughs> hand in the right direction then I you know I'd be really happy to support that. Um, yeah the um, Devon Recovery Learning Community yeah um, which is so it comes under the Devon Partnership Trust umbrella they're a really proactive group they offer free courses they're they're trying to keep going with courses as much as they can even through lockdown because there are special dispensations um because it's a support group um but they're involved in this um open water swimming group um which is currently running but they're also they've also um they're doing quite a lot online as well and trying so for people to connect in that way that can't actually get out mm. as well so that's a really mm. good resource they've got they do um like small walks and you know local walks and there's, yeah, there's so the open wa water swimming is that the sense of quite a close group that can go together um, and yeah. rather than sort of joining a public uh, open water swimming group yeah this so is i could see that if people haven't tried it before they might be quite anxious about it this is quite so i think my connection's a bit unstable i hope you could hear me there I could, yeah yeah, it's quite a contained yeah, yeah. moment. It's um, it's basically a, an organisation called Chill UK who've been um, running the group. So Mike, the guy that runs it, um, he sorts out the um, safety aspects, but he's a coast guard and a lifeguard. Yeah. Um, so it makes the group very number limited because he has to do all the risk assessment and make it very safe. So it's a group for eight people. Um, <clears throat> that runs on a on a Sunday so um and it's actually running alongside a research project um there's a couple of doctors involved and um, Dr Mark Harper and Amy Burlingham mm -hmm. and they're basically doing a clinical trial I think it's the, the first one in the country where they um the participants who've agreed to it um have a blood test at the beginning of the trial and after the eight sessions they have a follow-up blood test to check um, if it's had any effect on inflammatory markers but it's also researched um, to see the benefit on people with anxiety and depression and they're encouraged to keep a journal of their experiences so and then the Devon Learning Recovery College sorry I always say it the wrong way around the De Devon Recovery Learning 
college are already supporting that and they they put a sort of welcoming participants to sign up through them so, yeah um, and that's kind of how I got in, involved um I don't do it as part of my job but just because I love the swimming yeah. and it but I you know just have those conversations um yeah, it's great. supportive in that in that way I'm not describing it very well <laughs> No, you are. Right. You're describing it brilliantly. Are there, are there any? You mentioned it was happening. Um, you mentioned about them kind of looking at whether there's any impact on anxiety and depression. Is there any suggestion yet that it is having an impact, or is it too early to say? Because I would imagine, obviously, it must be. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, 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 um, Mike's been running quite a few groups already, and I think um, Portsmouth mm-hmm. University are coming on board, and they're hoping to roll it out as a national. Oh, that's brilliant. Think, yeah, the results are showing apparently to be I, like I say I'm not directly involved in the research yeah. side of things but um, no just from what I've seen we're only into our third or fourth week and it's absolutely amazing you know these people are turning up I mean at the, the group that I'm with are um, two of them are peer support workers within the trust and um, there's a couple of people who use the service um, yes yeah, mm. so there's a f- good mixture of people and honestly we turn up <laughs> Every week, and the, the, the horizontal hail at times, and we strip off into swimming costumes and go into the waves, and it's you know you can see the transformation and the excitement and the the energy is amazing. Yeah. And people are already talking about going between sessions, and mm. yeah, this conversation is a beautiful. Yeah, and just yeah. everyone's got these insane grins on their faces. Really, mm. it, it is. It's, it's amazing, and I'm so impressed that people have stripping off and going in because there's a lot of barriers yeah, to doing yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You know, it must be quite anxiety provoking. And it's not yeah. for you know, I'm sure it's not for everyone. And, and the fact that they've signed up and turned up every week, they're obviously half persuaded. And, yeah. It, it is great. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. I think uh Liz and I uh, we did a session together for third year undergraduate students last week last year, didn't we? Uh, and it was it was in October. And um, as we all went down to the seafront, it was pouring rain and it, it was it was amazing to see them out in the elements. The students have been under such pressure, so many deadlines, going out, dealing with practice, you know, really carrying such a lot and um, running down to the seafront under their umbrellas squealing and <laughs> the, the joy with which they kind of got off um, their clothes and got into the sea. And there was something really lovely about how levelling that is. It's something that you said earlier, Liz, just how um, people were able to enter into that space. Um, concerns about body image and stuff seemed, seemed to change in that kind of space somehow. And they all, they all, one of the things that I love to see is the difference between when they enter the sea and when they come out. Their faces are different. Yeah, yeah. yeah um and that was what you were saying about being around that campfire Mm. in the forest school as well and just noticing how and I'm thinking of uh Sam's question Nikki about Mm. uh you know what can I do and thinking you know it hasn't necessarily got to be very much you haven't got to get them out onto Dartmoor you haven't got to get them into the sea Mm. that isn't an option Mm. for a lot of people I think it's about doing what you can so for me you know, working in a in a locked environment where people couldn't go out. I took nature in mm. and we used that to facilitate those amazing stories. Um, you know, so I think just being mindful of the fact that this is a legitimate intervention. Um, you know, it's it's I think when I started working with nature 20 years ago, people maybe saw this as being a bit kind of tree huggery or, yeah. you know, a bit a bit far out. And, and maybe there were some people in management position who, who kind of rolled their eyes a little bit. But that doesn't happen now because I think people are starting to realise that actually this is legitimate. We've got plenty of research which tells us mm-hmm. that it's beneficial and that it can just be simple. It can just be a question of, you know, planting something in a window box with somebody. Yes. But, yeah. Yeah, I think that comes back to the, the last question we had from one of the students was, um, I live in central London, um, what can I do? So I guess this is somebody maybe who does have a little bit less access to kind of yeah. the kind of more wild spaces and they're looking more at kind of the, the importance of urban spaces. Yeah, yeah. and urban spaces 
you know, can be magical in their own right, can't they? And there's lots of really, really wonderful things that happen in urban spaces that we don't that we don't get in the countryside. And so it's really exploiting us. I remember working in London and we took people for a walk along alongside the Thames and there's all kinds of interesting stuff that goes on down there. There's all the mudlarking that happens yeah. on the banks of the Thames. Um, you know, there, there were sort of small garden areas in the hospital. We we took stuff inside. Um, so I think you know access to um there's a lot of really good material that looks at access to urban parks as well and i know that sometimes that might not feel safe for people for some of the reasons that we've discussed but maybe in a group context maybe if there were a few people together yeah maybe that that would change things as well and i think like you were saying you know the use of story for, uh, for people who can't actually get outside you know stories about being in nature or, or people talking about memories of when they had spent time in nature um mm -hmm. or um like I say, it doesn't doesn't have to be a really big intervention just a simple mm -hmm. things point i don't know sometimes when you see the sky reflected in a puddle or i think we were saying before we came live, you know, it's amazing where buddleia can grow, even in a yeah. city. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and sometimes I think when, you, yeah. when nature breaks through in those environments, it's even more mm. beautiful, isn't it? Because it shows, mm. demonstrates the resilience of nature and the fact that, you know, when the human mm. race is <laughs> gone, you know, hopefully nature will still be there. Actually, mm. I heard something lovely on the radio about, you know, with the, all the awful global news going on, how so go outside in bare feet and feel the dewy earth and, and look at the birds, you know, mm. twittering about because they're completely oblivious to all mm. the things that we're preoccupied. Mm. And that's I think so. many of us said, you know, um, during the first lockdown, and I know I, I filmed near where I live, the sounds of nature just mm. it was so amplified mm. because, you know, yeah. animals were able to come out again and mm. birds the sound of birds was much louder and everything mm. and really like beneficial impact on on nature um, and you know that's got to be a good thing and that but that also makes me think that you know we need to maybe have we've talked very positively about nature but perhaps we also need to say a little bit about climate change as well within this conversation yeah, yeah I mean um in 2011 uh there were 15 million people uh, displaced due to adverse climate events mm. in the world and they've got to go somewhere um, yeah. and those individuals obviously are often not made welcome mm. um, they will mm. experience trauma mm. they may have experienced life-changing in injury uh, bereavement death loss on a scale that we can barely imagine yeah. so globally you know it's a really difficult picture and um, people are more likely to expose to be exposed to violence to mm. poor housing poor treatment sexual assault all of it you know we, we know that the addiction levels rise as well yeah. uh, people living in unstable housing you know you, th you think about mental health and think about mental health assessment it's it's the worst possible scenario but even yeah. here you know in in the floods that have happened on and off mm -hmm. through the last years how traumatic that is for families mm -hmm. and um you know then they've got to deal with things like poor treatment from insurance companies unstable housing living in medication uh, living in uh, places probably that are damp and um, unsuitable and harmful in many ways and so with the climate changing um, we're more likely to be exposed to those kind of adversities and so um whilst that is a difficult reality that we're all having to get our heads around we're having to think about resource use yeah. interruptions in the supply chain not being able to get the things that we need um the other side of that is that whilst the nhs is one of the biggest polluters in europe i think it's the fifth mm -hmm. heaviest polluter i think oh, we're also 
the um, health organization that's credited with with actually being the most proactive and responsive to climate change. Mm -hmm. So we've got a good track record and there are lots of really good people that are invested in dealing with this problem. And so we we can all get involved and we can all do something. Yeah, as well, it's like encouraging that engagement mm. with nature. It's kind of, you start to value it. It's like people hadn't realised until this lockdown, I don't think, how much they got from nature. And then it's a, mm. a reciprocal process. You know, if you mm. engage with your environment and appreciate it and start to love it, then you're, you're more motivated to try and... Yeah, I agree. It. And, and, you know, there's a, there's, I can't remember what it's called, but there's a triangle, isn't there, of benefit of being in nature. It's an exercise in the connectedness. And also, if you can become part of a cause that's bigger than yourself, it's like yeah. even a, you know, a two-minute litter pickup. It can make you feel so good about yourself and then mm. give you a break from your own individual problems, I think, when you can work collectively and get involved with volunteer mm. projects. It's been, I don't know what the research is, but it's been shown to be massively beneficial on so many levels. Yeah. And I think um, you know, one of the problems that we've got is that um we're very anthropocentric in our thinking. You know, everything's about what can we get from nature. You know, we go there with the idea we're gonna take something away. Um and that kind of thinking is a part of what's got us into this mess in the first yeah. place. So starting to think more about reciprocity and yes we can go and it's gonna be potentially quite healing uh, for us but also mm -hmm. is that environment should be getting something from that too uh, you know care and interest um, and a lot of people who have been involved in various projects I've been involved in over the years have have gone on to volunteer or, or spend time in those environments and you know they care about them mm -hmm. because one of the things um, I think, Nikki, something that you shared earlier on, on your feed was that nature doesn't judge you. And yes. however you are, whoever you are, if you're finding people difficult, you can go out into a natural setting. And a lot of people re report feeling that sense of connection or belonging that maybe mm -hmm. they struggle with in other contexts. And so yeah. I think there's a sort of genuine will to care and it's just creating the right conditions for that to happen, really. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think that's a really good note to kind of wrap mm. up on in a sense, because I'm just looking, we've already we're slightly over, aren't we, already? Oh. Because we've really got into, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been a great... We've covered some ground, that's for sure. <laughs> really, <laughs> you know, we've talked in detail, haven't we? Um, but I'm just thinking it might be good to maybe go around and just, you know, make sure that um, there's nothing that we've missed, really, that people really mm. want to tonight and obviously Nikki as well if you've got any final yeah. questions as well that have come through so Dave had one about park run but let's just ignore it <laughs> <laughs> and hear what the panel have to say yeah all right we'll go over to um we can pick up any questions as well can't we on social media absolutely after, um we'll have a look we'll keep an eye on the channels so Sarah should we go over to you first then yeah, I think I just want to support uh, practitioners and students mm. um, to know that this is a legitimate thing to do and that there's plenty of research and it really can be so beneficial and it isn't always the big things. It's just the simple things that you can do every day um, and that we're here if you want to talk to us. I could talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. That's great. And, um, and Liz? Yeah, I suppose that in a similar similar vein, I think anybody working you know, in the mental health service, especially at the moment, it's 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 kind of um, I know it's something that really helps me through at times of great stress. Yeah. I think that's why it means so much to me because I mean yeah. you know, I, I suffer with a level of anxiety myself, and and it's that nature engagement is what really helps me. And I suppose it's an enthusiasm to share. That and it, you know, it doesn't. It you know, there's all sorts of different ways of expressing that, but it's um, mm. it's very accessible, even in places where you, it might not be so obvious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, then, um, I mean, I think tonight's been brilliant. We've covered mm. so much, haven't we? From talking about sort of blue space, um, you know, nature, um, you know, healing, using nature within, you know, practice, climate change. Um, I think we've covered quite a lot. Um, quite a lot. Yeah, 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 quite a lot. 
I think I feel like we need to have a lot more conversation about this. Is the, mm. you know, that I think it might be quite useful to, you know, to come back to this conversation at some point, and you know, we'd welcome you both back. Mm. Um, I think over the next couple of days as well, we'll keep an eye on the social media feed, and if people want to um, put any other questions on mm. or want um, us to point us towards any of the links and resources that you've mentioned tonight as well mm. and then we'll, we'll make sure that we answer people's questions and forward information on to people as well great yeah. absolutely thank you and thank, thank you. you so i think thank that's you. it yeah so yeah thank you everyone for um for participating tonight it's been a great conversation and to people who are listening or following on Twitter, thank you as well. Yeah. And um, and we'll say good night. We'll see you next time. Good Bye. Night. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.